I thank the members for their attention. It is now time for question period. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, the electricity system in Ontario is in a mess. You've wasted $2 billion on smart meters, $1.1 billion. That's $2 billion on smart meters, $1.1 billion on cancelled gas plants, and rates have skyrocketed by more than $1,000 a year for the average homeowner since you took office. The people are fed up with your hydro mismanagement. Now you're planning to sell a majority stake in Hydro One, 60 percent in fact, to raise money you can't come up with otherwise. But don't worry, Mr. Speaker, the Premier says rates might not go up because the Ontario Energy Board is there to protect consumers. It's the same Energy Board that just approved a rate increase of over $68 a year. Premier, why should ratepayers believe your line that the OEB will lift Question. rate increases when yesterday they did the exact opposite? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just uh, address uh, the part of the question, and I, I, uh, I know that uh, we will uh, we'll speak to the rates in the supplementary, but Mr. Speaker, let me just be clear that the reason that we uh, have undertaken the review of assets in this province, Mr. Speaker, the reason that Ed Clark and his panel were asked to look at the assets that were built by and owned by the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and have served the people of Ontario very well, is that we need to build new assets, Mr. Speaker. Yep. We need to build new infrastructure that will serve us in the, in the current environment and in the future, Mr. Speaker. If we don't do that, if we don't make those investments, then we actually hobble the ability of this province to be able to grow. We hobble the ability of communities to be able to thrive, and we restrict the, uh, we restrict the attraction of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, to businesses from other places. So we must make these investments in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Back to the Premier. I don't think I'm the only Ontarian that's skeptical of your plan. After all, you never campaigned on it, and you never held public consultations. You just did it. There's not even a cost-benefit analysis of the majority sale. Yet you and your trusted adviser, Ed Clark, assured Ontarians that rates won't go up with confident phrases like, we don't think so, and I can't guarantee they won't. Premier, you and I both know you don't care about what the ratepayer pays, just as long as you get your money. Yep. A simple question, Premier. Would you still have sold a majority stake in Hydro One if you had balanced the budget? Well, Mr. Speaker, as I have said repeatedly, and I will continue to say because it is the truth, what I care about is absolutely that we have an we have a, an affordable and a reliable supply of energy, Mr. Speaker, which, quite frankly, when we came into office in 2003, the hydro system— Stop the clock, please. I'm, uh, I'm absolutely ready to uh, bring people to order, and I'll do so quickly. Very little interruption for question and lots of interruption for answer. Absolutely no reliability in the electricity system when we came into office, Mr. Speaker. There were blackouts and brownouts. I can remember knocking on doors in 2003, Mr. Speaker, and the number one issue was people not knowing whether their power supply was going to be in place. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order. The member from Nepi and Carleton will come to order. Thank you. Carry on, please. There was no confidence in the electricity system, Mr. Speaker. There were brownouts and blackouts across the province, and it was absolutely imperative that when we came into office that we rebuild the system, that we do the we do the upgrading that was necessary, Mr. Speaker. We've done that upgrading, and as the as the member opposite knows, Mr. Speaker, there is a cost associated with that. He also knows that the Ontario Energy Board sets rates, Mr. Speaker, and will set rates. After Thank you. <coughs> Final supplementary. Premier, it's obvious that what's happened here is you promised a lot more than you can deliver. That's right. You drove the province into the ground for 12 years, yep. and now the only way out is on the back of ratepayers. Yep. You continue to say that the OEB will regulate prices and that they won't go up, but every bit of evidence confirms the complete opposite. Ontarians have your word on one hand and the Energy Board's latest increase on the other. Yep. So, Premier, as the PC caucus's fifth and final ask, will you commit to reducing energy prices so that all businesses, Minister of Economic all Development, all ratepayers and businesses no longer have to pay some of the highest energy costs in North America? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Conservatives wanted to sell it all. Mr. Speaker, um, let's be clear about the Ontario Energy Board. Mr. Speaker, rate applications go before the Ontario Energy Board. Some of the history, Mr. Speaker, is in 2010, Hydro One asked for a rate increase for distribution, received a 9% reduction, Mr. Speaker. In 2012, Hydro One asked for a rate increase for transmission, received a 3% reduction, Mr. Speaker. When Ontario Power Generation applied for a 6.2% rate increase in 2011, Mr. Speaker, the OBE, OEB denied this request and lowered rates by 0.8%. Mr. Speaker, ah. there is a history of the OEB refusing requests for rate increases because they can. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, will come to order. And uh, stop, clock, please. And now I will also remind you that I am not. Uh, impressed when I hear people use anything else other than their writing or their title when speaking at all. New question. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Ed Clark's report on the sale of Hydro One offers a handful of recommendations, uh, the first being, uh, and I quote, the province should proceed immediately with a sale or merger of its interest in Hydro One Brampton to or with Enersource Corporation, PowerStream, and Horizon. End of quote. The report, Mr. Speaker, simply speculates that the government would receive $607 million for the sale. It offers no evidence on how the sale price was calculated. We are simply being asked to take the Premier and Mr. Clark's word for it. Premier, will you call for the Auditor General to help to review the Hydro One Brampton deal so Ontarians will have some assurance that they're receiving the best value? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to uh, comment uh, on the specifics. But let me, let me again, Mr. Speaker, remind the party opposite and uh, their interim leader that what we are doing here is we have, we have made a decision and we ran on this decision, Mr. Speaker. It was in our budget to invest in infrastructure and, as part of that, Mr. Speaker, to review the assets that were owned by the people of this province to make sure that we were optimizing the value of those assets. Assets so that we could invest in the, the roads and the bridges and in every riding Second across time. this province, Mr. Speaker, because there's not a community, there's not a region of this province that doesn't need investment in roads, in bridges, in public transit, Mr. Speaker. So, because of the neglect of government after government, Mr. Speaker, because of the work that was not done before 2003, Mr. Speaker, we need to continue to make those Answer. investments if we are going to be competitive in the 21st century. That's the commitment. I made, Mr. Speaker, and that's the commitment that we're following through on. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, that's not a very good answer for one of the biggest asset, sale, asset sales in the history of the province. Mr. Speaker, this government's financial mismanagement has been embarrassing. Billions of taxpayers' dollars wasted every time you take a turn. For a Premier who came in preaching openness and transparency, something about this Hydro One Brampton sale simply does not add up. Mr. Speaker, why should the people of Ontario believe that a prearranged sale, organized in secret by the Premier's back room, yep. why should the people of Ontario believe that this is the best deal for an asset that they own? <laughs> Premier, if you intend on selling Hydro One Brampton, will you put it on the open market to ensure Ontarians get fair value for the company that they own. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Premier set up the Asset Council, Mr. Speaker, with very, very experienced people, a mixture of people from different backgrounds, different parties, different philosophies, but headed up by Mr. Ed Clark. Mr. Speaker, they created a revolving door of advisors coming in, consultants coming in, Mr. Speaker, to explore all of the elements of, of the recommendations that they were making, Mr. Speaker. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, the selling price was close to twice as much as Hydro One had paid for it, a very, very significant uplift in value, Mr. Speaker, which represents a very good investment of a previous government to do that, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, we had seven municipalities, seven mayors and seven councils, we expect, who have supported this, Mr. Speaker, Answer. because it improves it for the ratepayer and it 
it improves the revenue for all of those cities, Mr. Speaker, Thank including you. Markham and Barrie and many others. Final supplementary. Go well, back to the Premier. Premier, we simply don't accept that your backroom political dealings and prearranged sale is the best value for this public asset. You were wrong when you said the cost of cancelling gas plants was $40 million when it really was $1.1 billion. You were wrong when you said the Green Energy Act would cost hydro customers about the price of a cup of coffee when the real cost is $1,100 per year. For the last 12 years of fiscal mismanagement in this province, no one no one accepts that your deal Minister, the environment. is the best deal for this public asset. And why should they accept your word for it? Your word simply is no good when it comes to these transactions. Yeah. Premier, the people of Ontario deserve all the information respecting the value and sale of Hydro One Brampton, again an asset that they own. Why won't you allow the Auditor General Question. to do the sale before it goes through? Because they deal with it. Thank you. Minister of Energy. What does Pat Mr. Brown think of this? Mr. Speaker, the merger we're looking at is, is not a 407 deal, Mr. Speaker. It's not a deal where we, we, we sell off to somebody and let them make profit out of it, Mr. Speaker, and let them totally 100 percent control it, Mr. Speaker. That's what they did with 407. Mr. Speaker, we have created here. Uh, it could be with you. <laughs> Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, we have created here a utility uh, of one million customers, which uh, rivals uh, uh, Toronto Hydro, Mr. Speaker, the second largest in the province. Mr. Speaker, there were seven municipalities involved, seven utilities, which came together to create Answer. this consolidation, Mr. Speaker. It's good for the ratepayer, it's good for the shareholders, all of the councils, and every Thank single you. mayor of seven cities endorsed it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier is planning to privatize Hydro One. She said she was going to govern from Deputy something Houseleer. she called the Activist Centre. Wow. It turns out that the Activist Centre is so far to the right that even the Tories are saying that the Premier's privatization plan for Ontario is bad. It's a bit rich, Speaker, for the Premier to insist she's leading a progressive government when she's right of the Conservatives. Can the Premier explain exactly how it is, uh, Mr. Speaker, that she lost her way so terribly? Minister of Tourism and Sport from the order. Premier. Sure. And, uh, as I said, I understand why the leader of the third party wants to uh, go through a recalibrating exercise for herself to relocate herself yeah, on the political continuum, Mr. Speaker, because who knows where she was in the uh, election? Who knows what she stands for? What we stand for, Mr. Speaker, is making practical decisions that are in the best interest of this province. And right now, Mr. Speaker, across this province, we need to invest in infrastructure. There is no doubt. I have sat with groups of mayor after groups of mayor, whether it's in the north, whether it's in the greater Toronto-Hamilton area, Mr. Speaker, whether whether it's large urban mayors or whether it's rural mayors, Mr. Speaker, and they have said to me unanimously that they need investment in infrastructure. That is a necessity. And so, Mr. Speaker, that's what we're doing. We ran on that, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We said that we were going to invest in roads and bridges and transit, and that's what we're going to do, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. No, Speaker, this is my second. Su supplementary. The Premier is creating a brand new beer ombudsman so that people can complain if their beer is flat, but she's pushing the Ontario ombudsman out of Hydro One. The Premier was pretty, has a pretty serious problem with her priorities here, Speaker. Why does she think that the people of Ontario deserve less oversight with their electricity system? Well, Mr. Speaker, as I have been very clear, uh, 
it was it was very much a concern of mine and ours that there be uh, that there be oversight that there be control that the province had have a, a 40% share mr speaker and have the controls in terms of regulation and price control that are in place now and that we continue those but mr speaker let me just speak to the ideological uh, bent that the uh, leader of the third party is on right now and just give her some feedback from some of the people who actually think this is a good idea um, first of all let me let me quote from the power workers union uh, the power workers union understand and this is don mckinnon the president of the power workers union and i quote the power workers union welcomes and supports the decision by government to keep hydro one whole in an ipo process that would in partnership with government broaden the ownership yes, structure in hydro one this will position the company to grow and provide further high skill quality jobs yeah. for ontarians unquote Speaker, the Premier is spending months and months, exhaustive amounts of time, to study whether she wants to sell 12 packs of beer in the LCBO in 10 stores. On the other hand, she doesn't need any time at all, no time whatsoever, to decide to sell off Hydro One to Bay Street, a plan that will mean higher electricity bills for every single Ontarian. Now that's on top of the $70, of course, that was announced as an increase yesterday by Ontario Energy Board. This plan is wrong, Speaker. The Premier's priorities are wrong, Speaker. The Premier has lost her, lost her way, and my question is, will she pull the plug? on this wrong-headed privatization plan. Thank you. So again, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the leader of the third party is trying to find her way. I would suggest that supporting a plan that would invest in transit infrastructure, roads and bridge across the province might be a way to help her back to her way, Mr. Speaker. And I will also remind her that the Ontario Energy Board, which sets prices now, will set prices after this, uh, this deal is in place, Mr. Speaker. But I also want to just again remind the member opposite, this is also about creating jobs. Jo uh, Joseph Mancinelli, who's the vice president Central and Eastern uh, Ca Canada Regional Manager of Leuna International, Mr. Speaker, the building trades. He says, and I quote, the Wynn Liberal government is to be commended for today's announcement implementing sweeping changes in our province, which will greatly benefit all Ontarians. The $4 billion these changes will introduce for investment in infrastructure projects, the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, is welcome news to Leuna and our members. Job creation is one of the key components Answer. of this initiative, and we welcome the much-needed infrastructure and the thousands of jobs that will be created for our members for years to come." Unquote. Leader of the third party. Speaker, I hope the Premier told Joe that $4 billion won't even get half of the downtown relief line built. My question is for the, the uh, Premier. Speaker. The Premier says that a privatized Hydro One won't be under the Ombudsman's Thank you. Question, please. Premier says that a privatized Hydro One won't be under the Ombudsman's oversight. Can the Premier guarantee Ontarians that the CEO of the new private hydro company will still be appearing on the Sunshine List, Speaker? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, I, um, I would have thought that the, uh, that the member opposite might have been interested in the transit that uh, can be built as a result of these announcements in Hamilton, for example, Mr. Speaker, in the GTA writ large, Mr. Speaker. I would have thought that she would have uh, been quite interested in the, uh, the needs of the constituents around the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, but apparently not, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, we are building. The NDP basically is saying don't build. Don't build this province up. Don't invest in the infrastructure that's needed. Don't create 20,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, a year. Don't do that. Stay stuck in ideology, Mr. Speaker. Don't look at practical solutions. And when I talk about the activist centre, Mr. Speaker, that's what I mean. Looking for the answers to the problems that are presenting themselves today. Not looking back 100 years and deciding today what we should do based on 100 years ago. That's not what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will come to order and he's very close to being asked to withdraw.
I'm not amused. Supplementary. The Premier says that a privatized Hydro One won't be under the scrutiny of the Ombudsman, under Ombudsman oversight. She's not telling us whether or not the CEO and other executives are going to be uh, subject to the sunshine list. Can the Premier guarantee Ontarians that the Freedom of Information Act will still apply to the new privatized hydro company? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, just, just a couple of facts that I'm sure the, uh, the uh, leader of the third party is aware of but has neglected to mention. There will be a new Hydro One Ombudsman. She, uh, she knows that, I think, Mr. Speaker. And she also knows that there's a different set of accountability measures for publicly traded companies. The CEO salary will be disclosed according to OSC rules. So she knows that, Mr. Speaker. But I think the bottom line here is that the leader of the third party has no faith in the private sector. And in fact, she, had a, she made a statement to that effect, Mr. Speaker. She said that she has no faith in the private sector, and that is that is a um, that is a, a fundamental jobs. difference between us. I believe, and I, we believe, that it's important that government partner with the private sector. That the private sector, Mr. Speaker, has done an enormous amount of good. And I was at an event uh, just on the weekend that That's was sir. a prime example of a private part, uh, private public partnership, where a community centre is going to be built in conjunction, City of Toronto Thank working you. with the private sector. The NDP was there. They were very happy. About that. Thank you. Final supplementary. A watchdog at Hydro One, the Ombudsman, who looks after the interests of the public speaker, but the Premier wants to pull his teeth. We currently have transparency through the Sunshine List at Hydro One, but the Premier wants to pull the shades on that speaker. Minister of Economic we currently have accountability order, through Freedom of Information at Hydro One, but the Premier wants to slam the door on that accountability. The Premier's plan will limit access to information. It will limit transparency. It will limit Remember accountability. It order. will drive rates sky high. The Premier's plan is wrong, Speaker. Why can't she see that? When did she lose her way, Speaker? Thank you, well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say again that I made a commitment to the people of Ontario that we would invest in them, that we would invest in the infrastructure that is needed in their communities, that we would work with them to create the conditions to bring business to this province and create jobs, Mr. Speaker. And that's what this is about. What the NDP is saying is that we shouldn't make those investments, we shouldn't create those jobs, and we shouldn't look for solutions, Mr. Speaker. And the, the leader of the NDP said on April 16th, she said, and I quote, I don't have any faith whatsoever in the private sector, unquote. That's quite a statement, Mr. Speaker. Given that Given that we, as a government and as a people, rely on the private sector, Mr. Speaker, we rely on the private sector to create jobs, to innovate, to draw investment to the province, Mr. Speaker. And she chooses not to have any desire or any understanding that we need to work with Thank the you. private sector if we're going to thrive. Thank you. New question, the member from Simple North. Minister, today is the second day that 24,000 students in Durham yeah. don't have classes to attend. Poor kids. Yesterday, you said you were mystified, you were perplexed, and you weren't sure why the board was striking. Well, Minister, you can be perplexed and mystified no longer. The reason the board is striking and the reason for a second day that 24,000 students are out of the classroom, the reason is 12 years of Liberal fiscal mismanagement. Uh, sounds about right. Minister Sudbury, the OSSTF and Sudbury could strike on April the 27th, and we've just found out that OSSTF Peel just announced that they may strike on May the 4th. This isn't a local issue anymore. The buck stops with the Liberal government and with you, Minister. Minister, how many more boards need to strike before you realize Question. why they walked away from negotiations? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And obviously, we're high, very concerned about the students who are are missing classes, and that uh, uh, we understand that students and parents Remember want from Prince Edward the teachers Hastings, back in the classroom. The kids want to get back in the classroom. They, which is actually great, that students are telling us that they want to get back back into uh, their studies. But I think it is quite important to understand that the way that uh, the Collective Bargaining Act is structured 
is that some issues are dis uh, discussed at a provincial level. The central table includes the Crown, so yes, I am responsible for being at that table, and the Trustee Association and the Provincial Union. And that central table continues to have talks. Answer. Talks are going on at the central table. Unfortunately, it's some of the local tables where talks have broken Thank you. Down. Supplementary. Uh, back to the minister, Mr. Speaker. You, you said uh, yesterday you hadn't heard a coherent explanation as to why Durham is striking. Mr. Speaker, the member from Guelph is the Minister of Education. If she hasn't heard a coherent explanation or been given a proper briefing, I hope she spends time today interviewing new staff. But I suppose I could save her the trouble. The strike in Durham is because of your 12 years of liberal fiscal mismanagement. You can't negotiate fairly, and you're backtracking on election promises. Minister, will you stop blaming? Order. Will you stop blaming? The stop the clock, please. Order. Please, sir. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Minister, will you stop blaming the local boards and take responsibility before bo more boards strike in this province? Minister. I I, I, I uh, would quibble a little bit with the, with the wording. Start the clock. Thank you. Minister. Because I think it's, it's important that we don't get into a, a situation of assigning blame here or a blame there or blame there. What's important is that at both levels we have talks. We do have talks going on because the only way to reach an agreement is if we're talking. We are negotiating at the central table where I do have responsibility and we understand that we must arrive at a negotiating ag agreement. Answer. But we also know that at the local level, we need the local parties. And I would point out that these are the people Thank you. whose last platform was to— Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, yesterday Ontarians learned that they will be paying another $70 a year on their hydro bill to pay for liberal waste and mismanagement of the hydro system. But instead of trying to make things better— and using our strategic energy assets like Hydro One to help people conserve, to help them get their bills under control, the Liberals are privatizing Hydro One and handing control over to Bay Street. Privatization is going to drive up Hydro bills just like it's always done. Yep. The OEB just approved another rate increase starting May 1st. Can the Premier tell Ontarians how much more she expects Rates to go up under her privatization plan. Lower than the Thank you. Minister. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm Francis Lankin. in December 2013, we issued a long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there was one page in that that uh, had particular attention from the opposition and others, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, that was our projected rate increases over the next four or five years, Mr. Speaker. Well, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we have been reducing the costs in the sector, and the announcement of a rate increase yesterday is less than what was predicted, Mr. Speaker, because we're getting a better handle on the sector, we're reducing our costs in the sector, Mr. Speaker, and we're making efforts towards the ratepayer in many other ways as well, Mr. Speaker, and I'll deal with that in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And again, back to the Premier. Ontarians have bills almost twice as high as people get in Manitoba and Quebec, where their public utilities are owned by the people. We are watching our rates go up faster, and what you put in place will only make it worse. The Premier hasn't learned the lesson that public hydro is more affordable. Her privatization plan is going to be bad for conservation, bad for innovation, bad for jobs, bad for business, bad for the people of Ontario. Premier, this is a lousy plan. When are you going to pull the plug on privatization? 
Mr. Speaker. We can expect a lot of rhetoric coming from the opposition parties, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that the electricity prices in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, are lower than three other provinces, Mr. Speaker. Carry on, please. They're lower than three other provinces, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Manitoba and Quebec is lower than us because they have legacy hydro projects, Mr. Speaker, that enable that. In Canada, we're in the middle of the pack, Mr. Speaker, and we hear them also say that we've got the highest rates in North America. They should look at Detroit. They should look at New York. They should look at Boston, Mr. Speaker, where it's 18, 19, 20 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker. We are lowering the pressures on price, Mr. Speaker. We are lowering that as well, Mr. Speaker, by uh, by doing what we're yes, doing sir. with Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. It'll be more efficient, Mr. Speaker, in the long run. The ratepayers will be protected. Our Thank plan you. is working. Question, the member from Glengarry, Prescott, Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. It's always a privilege for me, Speaker, to uh, bring to this House issues that are of interest to my constituents in Glengarry, Prescott, Russell. And one of those issues that I regularly hear about is whether uh, it's through meetings or talking to uh, the mayors and councillors uh, is connecting links. Speaker, there's two connecting links in my riding of Glengarry, Prescott, and Russell. There's one in the township of Champlain and one in the town of Hawkesbury. And since the connect Connecting Links program ended in 2012, many in my community have felt the financial pressure of keeping these roads in good working uh, order and condition. Speaker, through you, could the minister please tell the members of this House what our government is doing to help municipalities with their connect Connecting Links? Well, thank you very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell for the question, but also for his incredibly strong advocacy for his community. The member is 100% correct, Speaker. We have continued to hear from Ontario municipalities about the need for additional funding for their connecting links. Municipalities have told us that making connecting links projects eligible under the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund has not been sufficient. So we listened, the Premier listened, our government listened, and we have been committed to working with municipalities to address this issue. That's why I was extremely happy to be in Sault Ste. Marie yesterday with the Minister of Government Services and the Minister of Northern Development and Mines to formally announce that the province is committing $15 million annually to a new Connecting Links program. Answer. This announcement, Speaker, is only one part of our government's plan to unlock the value of certain public assets, which will provide approximately $4 billion to build new Thank transit you. and other priority infrastructure projects through our Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that uh, very comprehensive response and the great announcement that you did make yesterday. Speaker, there's 352 connecting links in Ontario and 70 bridges and 77 municipalities across the province. Uh, as I indicated earlier, two of these connecting links uh, are found in my community and my riding of Glengarry, Prescott and Russell. But I've also heard other members in this House speaker talk about connecting links within their ridings, often discussing the difficulties their local municipalities are having keeping these roads in good shape. I know those living in my communities will be very pleased to hear more about the funding being offered through the new Connecting Links program. Speaker, through you, can the minister uh, tell the members of this House when Ontario municipalities can expect to start receiving funding from the new Connecting Links program? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker, and again, I thank that member for his question. As I mentioned previously, this new program is only one part of our government's plan to unlock the value of certain public assets, making more funding available for transit and transportation projects like Connecting Links through our Moving Ontario Forward plan. This means that what was announced in April 2014 as a nearly $29 billion investment in Moving Ontario Forward is now a $31.5 billion commitment over the next 10 years. Through the Moving Ontario Forward Plan, Speaker, Connecting Links funding is expected to begin in the spring of 2016. But, Speaker, we want to make sure that we get this program right, which is why we'll continue to consult with municipalities to ensure the new program meets their needs. We look forward to continuing to work with our municipal partners on this incredibly important project. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, Ontario's Ombudsman's ongoing probe into Hydro One's billing fiasco is now the largest ever undertaken by his office, with more than 10,500 public complaints and an average of 10 new complaints each day still. 
Residents of my riding have experienced this firsthand with hundreds of customers, including small businesses, who have gone months without a bill, only to be advised that they owe thousands and will be disconnected if they don't pay in full. Now, with your plan to sell off a majority stake in Hydro One, it will leave its customers without access to the Ontario Ombudsman's oversight. Premier, is your government trying to run away from the accountability of the Ombudsman's oversight and another critical report on the energy file? Speaker, I know that the Minister of Energy will want to speak to the specifics, but let me just say that, uh, in fact, we believe that Hydro One can be a much better run company. And uh, in the work that uh, in the work that Ed Clark and his uh, and his group did, Mr. Speaker, they came to that conclusion, and they believe that uh, uh, broadening the ownership in uh, Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, and realizing uh, the uh, the benefit of that, reinvesting in infrastructure, that that will be good for the people of Ontario on a number of fronts, Mr. Speaker, including having a more efficient company. But, Mr. Speaker, I also want to say that uh, the announcement that was just referenced in terms of connecting links is part. Of this, you know, I know that members opposite, uh, particularly in the uh, the opposition, claim to have the concerns of people in small communities and rural communities at heart. They should be very, very Answer. supportive of a connecting links program, Mr. Speaker, because the members who come to the Good Roads Conference and to Roma, they talk about over and over again the need for infrastructure investment in connecting links, and that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Well, Premier, you have increased the Ontario Ombudsman oversight with Bill 8, only to turn around and take it away from Hydro One. Just last week, you announced that a beer ombudsman would be created to watch over beer sales. Well, Premier, families in Ontario are more concerned with their lights being on than their Bud Light being cold. So, even though one can't really happen without the other. We have seen this before with other scandals like Orange and the gas plants, where oversight has been created after the Deputy fact. House Leader. Premier, will you help protect the customers of Ontario's largest electricity provider by allowing proper oversight by the Ontario Ombudsman? Minister of Energy. Here, Minister Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Hydro One tra tra transformation uh, is going to take a number of months. In the meantime, uh, there's plenty of time for the Ombudsman to report. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, with respect to the work that the Ombudsman has been doing, yes, he's received over 10,000 complaints, Mr. Speaker. They're generated out of a new billing system. There are about 3,300 complaints that have been referred to Hydro One for resolution, Mr. Speaker. To date, Hydro One has successfully resolved 99% percent of the billing complaints it received from the Ombudsman, Mr. Speaker. Refunds and credits are being given, and accommodation is being given, Mr. Speaker, to all those who have been impacted. Right now, Mr. Speaker, the, the level of complaint is less than what would normally hap have happened over the course of the last five, seven, or ten years, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Windsor West. The Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Education stated that she was perplexed about the current labour dispute in Ontario's education sector. Speaker, what I find truly perplexing is that the Liberal government, the Premier, is considering removing limit on class sizes, the signature education policy of her predecessor, Dalton McGuinty, and forcing students and teachers into larger classes. Speaker, can the Premier please explain to Ontarians why the Liberal government is flip-flopping on class sizes and throwing our schools into chaos? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And let me just repeat what I said previously: is that there, the the legislation is very clear. When you have a central negotiations, we're talking about money issues that have to do with, with money, with finances, with provincial policy. Those are the issues that are being negotiated at the central table. And there could theoretically be a, a central strike on central issues. When you have a local strike, and this is clearly a local strike in Durham. It is, by definition, under the law, a strike on local issues. That would be issues like transfer and surplus. We believe Sir? that the only way you solve this problem is to negotiate, and that's what exactly what we're doing at the central table where we sit. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary.
Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the Minister of Education for that lesson. What she does, uh, clearly doesn't know is negotiations are a give and a take, not just taking. Again to the Premier. Speaker, just yesterday, the Minister of Education claimed that she hadn't heard a coherent explanation of what local issues prompted education workers to walk out in Durham and that she is mystified by their actions. Maybe if the Premier and Minister actually consulted Ontario families and education workers before slashing education funding and forcing the closure of neighbourhood schools, they wouldn't be so mystified as to why Ontarians are so upset. Speaker, when will this government finally admit that their policies of education cuts and forced school closures are failing Ontarians? Minister. As I said, the only way to solve a cut Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. The only way to solve a labor problem is to negotiate. We are committed to negotiating a collective agreement, and that's why, as we speak, people are sitting negotiating to arrive at a central agreement. That is the role that we will continue to play because we are committed to achieving a central negotiated collective agreement. With respect to funding, I'm sorry that the NDP doesn't think that a 56% increase in funding it qualifies as an increase. They seem to think a 56% increase is a cut. I'm afraid I don't understand Thank NDP you. math. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Ministry of Social Services. And announced a significant investment in the developmental services sector in those individuals living with developmental disabilities. However, as you are aware, il existe des pressions considérables. There is a, a pressure on options for people suffering with uh, behavior cognitive development problem outside their home. Legislator Select Committee on Developmental Disabilities, there are some well-known concerns regarding the access to residential service. Moreover, the Auditor General released a report last year that noted the number of people waiting for residential supports. Monsieur le Président, est-ce que la Mr. Speaker, will the Minister explain what the government do to uh, resolve this problem. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and also thank you, the, the MPP for Orléans. The services offered to these uh, people is uh, as problem in Ontario, especially services in institutions. Two residential supports since Budget 2014, moving toward our commitment of 1,400 new urgent residential supports over four years. We are working with community partners in order to create a broader set of housing options for individuals with developmental disabilities. I had the opportunity to meet with my ministry's Developmental Services Housing Task Force last week and discuss their progress so far. Last month, the task force launched a call for proposals on innovative innovative housing solutions. I very much appreciate the work done by the Housing Task Force and Response, look forward to continuing answer. to work with them. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Orleans appreciate that this government wants community partners to play an active part in finding the best solutions. Minister, in the 2014 budget, your ministry committed to timelines to eliminate existing wait lists for people waiting for direct funding assistance. As you know, direct funding through special services at home for children until 18 and passports for adults provides funding for individuals and families that can be used towards particular programming at agencies of their choice. Through these direct funding programs, this government is helping to support individual choice and encourage independence for those with developmental services and their families. Mr. Le Président, est-ce que la... Mr. Speaker, will the minister share with the MPPs all the progress done in terms of financing to, uh, in terms of funding to end the waiting lists? Uh, 
thousand people now have new direct funding to purchase supports and services. That is 8,000 more children and 6,000 more adults here, since here. the 2014 budget. I have visited many places across the province, including Ottawa, and have witnessed firsthand the need of those with developmental disabilities and the support that our frontline workers and agencies are providing. As the member said, for the person having intellectual deficiency, this uh, direct funding provides services to live more in independently and, and contribute to with the, their community and help their family. And we want on family of Ontario to be a more inclusive uh, place for this uh, category of people. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, I've been asking for the release of the special purpose accounts for over three years now. Legislation in this House which states that they must be tabled yearly. The SBA account is generated from the fees collected from the hunters and anglers of this province and supposedly to be reinvested in resource management. Your government insists the SBA fund is decreasing. However, we cannot verify that assertion, but you refuse to table the documents. Hunters and anglers are facing increased fees, new service fees, and seniors may now have to purchase a fishing license. Minister, will you show some transparency and table the documents today? Thank you. Minister of National Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you very much, and uh, I thank the member for the question. I do believe at least two of the reports have been tabled. Uh, that the particular uh, member is referencing. I'll double-check, but I'm pretty sure two of them have been tabled. There is one yet to come, so I've been happy to, uh, to make that uh, offer of information that he's been looking for for some time available to him. Speaker, in, re in regard to the fees that the member continues to raise in this House, there was a significant consultation that was undertaken one or two years ago. Through that process, there were a variety of suggestions that came in through the consultation on what we needed to do to continue to keep the SPA whole. Many of those recommendations were dismissed. The member keeps flying the attitude about a senior's license uh, fee coming in. I've very publicly stated on a number of occasions that was suggested through the consultation. It's not something that I have ever contemplated doing. I've said that in here before. Answer. i say it in here again so the member perhaps in his next supplementary or in, in the future won't feel the need to reference a senior's licensing oh, issue on the SPA Thank you. in this particular legislature. Thank, Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, back to the Minister. Minister, I, I will continue to talk about that because we don't believe you on this side of the House. We don't know. Minister, you're introducing new fees, new uh, uh, incre increasing uh, the price of licenses in this province, and you're still behind in doc, uh, tabling the documents to this legislature. I find it really interesting that the Out of Doors magazine is able to have information on this current SBA fund. There are a few on the edge here. I find it interesting the Out of Doors uh, magazine has information to the SBA fund that has yet to be tabled in this legislature. So, Minister, I find that quite disrespectful to this chamber as a whole. Are you trying to manipulate the public by releasing snippets of incomplete information? Or you obviously, you obviously do have the reports prepared. Why won't you release them in, in totality? What are you hiding from the people of Ontario? Minister of Tourism and Sport come to order. Minister. Speaker, the SBA account has approximately $100 million a year in it. $66 million of that comes from the licensing and fees that come into the ministry. So it's a dedicated account that goes towards fish and wildlife management in the province of Ontario. And by way of example, in the Aylmer District, MNRF's Aylmer District, which I think is the member's riding, Plan spending is $873,000 on fish and wildlife management projects and $520,000 on enforcement in the 14-15 year, all from the SPA. Speaker, as well out of the SPA, we have been flying moose aerial inventories in the province of Ontario. Oh. Goes both ways. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London, you asked. Listen. Carry on. 
Thank you, Speaker. Almost every wildlife management unit in the province of Ontario has now been flown over the course of the last two or three years to determine what the moose population Answer. numbers are. We're taking the SPA money, we're using it for what it was intended to do. It's creating the databases upon which we can make reliable decisions on behalf of fishermen and hunters. Yeah. In the Thank you. Chief Foster, the, member, the member from Bramley, Gore, Malkin. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A new study by two York University professors confirms what new Democrats have been saying all along. Auto insurance companies are making record profits, while Ontario families are paying the highest auto insurance premiums in the country. In 2013 alone, Ontarians were overcharged for auto insurance by an estimated $840 million. Shameful. This is absolutely unacceptable. The Liberal government has the ability to reduce premiums. However, time and time again, what they're doing instead is giving more and more profits to insurance companies. They're breaking their promise. The Liberal government had said very clearly they promised to reduce auto insurance by 15%, but instead they haven't Question. delivered half of that. This is, again, another broken promise. Enough is enough. Will this government, in the upcoming budget, Thank commit you. to following through on their promise? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations, Congratulations on being deputy of the New Democratic Party. And that has delivered his very first question. Now, as deputy leader of the NDP, I expect you to support the resolutions and the work we're doing to lower auto insurance rates going forward. Let us not get back to what you did before, and that was delay the, what was necessary to bring these rates down. Exactly. You, we postponed the, the number of legislation that was required. That delay has, as a result, delayed the, 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 the opportunity for us to lower still the cost. And as a result, Mr. Yes, Speaker, sir. work that has been done is now transforming into lower costs. That is now we're halfway there. We need to get all Thank the way you. there with some legislation. I stand, you sit. No, no. You have sight. <coughs> Supplementary. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, what we did is we didn't support. So, uh, that, that's enough. Uh, the Deputy House Leader is warned. Carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. New data from the Financial Service Commission of Ontario shows very clearly that the Liberal government are dragging their feet to support drivers in Ontario, yet they move so quickly to put more profits in the pockets of insurance companies. The government has said reducing auto insurance is a part of their economic plan for Ontarians and that rates are coming down. But when we Minister speak to people, natural resources, we know that the rates aren't coming down. People are instead seeing the rates go up. How is it possible this government has been allowing insurance companies, individual ones, to increase their rates instead of bringing those down? Two years ago, this government made a promise, and they've broken that promise. When will we see real action on this file? Question. When will we see the government actually commit to reducing on auto insurance by 15%? Thank you. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, auto insurance rates must go down by co cutting costs, and as a result, we've taken actions to reduce the cost of claims. Right. It is true, Ontario cost of claims are far higher than they are in other provinces yeah. of Canada. Okay. And some of them require some tough decisions, so we hope that the NDP will support some of the legislation, some of the work we're doing to find ways to reduce costs. We also know that there are a number of companies now that have reduced their rates by more than 15 percent already, and we know that at working together with the competitive market that exists, we can further some of those reductions, but we need support from the NDP on this, Mr. Speaker. I'm looking at you. I'm hoping that you, they'll look at you as well, recognizing that together we can get it done. This budget will enable us to do that. I look to them to support it on the we support it for the Any questions? The member from Suffolk. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Our government recognizes that the wealth of natural resources found in Northern Ontario are vital to our northern economy. Forest harvesting and milling, as well as mineral production and processing, are an incredibly important part of my community of Sudbury and continue to be pathways to prosperity for all Northerners. Mr. Speaker, in 2014, the total number of direct jobs in mineral production was 26,000, with an additional 50,000 jobs associated with manufacturing and processing. And the forestry sector currently provides over 170,000 direct and indirect jobs in over 260 communities. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share the details of the recent Northern Industrial Elec Electricity Rate Program and how it will continue to Question. ensure a stable business climate and protect jobs in Northern Ontario? Wow. Thank you, Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thank you very much. Appreciate the question from the MPP from Sudbury. And Speaker, we know that the best way to protect uh, jobs for Northerners is to uh, ensure that Northern Ontario remains a destination where major mining, forestry, and the manufacturing companies choose to do business. And that certainly was one of the reasons. Is why we were so pleased to introduce the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program back in 2010. And this is a program, Speaker, designed to assist Northern Ontario's major industrial electricity consumers to reduce their electricity costs, create uh, and sustain jobs, maintaining global competitiveness. And, Speaker, that's why I was so excited two weeks ago, alongside uh, my colleagues, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, Minister of Government and Consumer Services, and the MPP for Sudbury, to announce an ongoing $120 million commitment to investment in the Northern Industrial Answer. Electricity Rate Program. Thank you. Speaker, we have heard loud and clear the program has helped position Ontario as an attractive uh, destination Thank for you. investment. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for that response. And we know the cost and supply of electricity is a major consideration for companies when they choose where to operate. And this program continues to receive positive feedback across the north. We heard the president of the Federation of Northern Ontario Municipalities state that this support is maintaining global competitiveness and helping sustain local jobs. And the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association has also expressed that this is great news for industry. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister outline what are the benefits to companies operating under the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you again to the member for the question. And, Speaker, the, the, this program is part of Premier Wins and our government's commitment to support the North and build a very strong economy across the province. And since launching, and Ms., we just heard about the uh, Connecting Link program and the $50 million commitment by the Minister of Transportation, another piece of that commitment. And since launching the Industrial Electricity Rate program in 2010, we have demonstrated that it can reduce industrial electricity rates on average up to 25 percent. And industry is certainly uh, telling us the same thing. Richard Garneau, um, resident forest product CAO president, said that the uh, program is the cornerstone of the electricity program in Northern Ontario. Gold Corp's Bill Gascon said it reduces our costs significantly on our site. Mark Boissonneau of uh, Glencore and said sir? that the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program is one of the puzzle pieces that will determine the company's future in Sudbury. We are very proud of this program, Mr. Thank you. New question, the member from Lennox, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier today. Premier, for over two years, the Standing Committee on the Legislative Assembly has been reviewing and debating electronic petitions. The mandate is simple. Not whether we should change the role of petitions, just simply whether we should allow online petitions in this House. And yet, for two years, despite countless research, presentations by the clerk, as well as by expert witnesses, the government committee members have ragged the puck. Last week at committee, the member for Scarborough Rouge River gave us our greatest insight why the government won't move forward. He said, and I quote, the worst thing governments can do is to give people hope. <laughs> Premier, is your government preventing electronic petitions in this legislative assembly because you fear Question. that they give people hope? <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the, uh, the question. Uh, uh, Speaker, I think, uh, I think we all know very clearly that if, if this government stands for, for accountability and transparency, the amount of work we have done in terms of uh, Bill 8 to ensure that government is more open, more accountable and transparent to the people of Ontario is exemplary, Speaker. Uh, not to mention, Speaker, the work that the... the member from Lanark will come to order. Carry on. Speaker, not to mention that the work uh, that the uh, the Open Government Panel has has done in regards to opening the government, making sure that there's more information that's available uh, to Ontarians, that there is uh, access to uh, open data, uh, it all speaks to ensuring that uh, people have more information available. Uh, Speaker, the, the committee is looking into the matter and we respect their deliberation in this Thank matter. Supplementary. It's like the House Leader likes to write the puck as well. <laughs> Premier, we've heard from expert witnesses that all three caucuses have the ability to implement electronic petitions immediately. That's because members from all three caucuses already use electronic petitions. We have the opportunity to finally take a step forward to modernize this legislature. Premier, will you commit to this House that your government will move forward and not raid the puck and allow electronic petitions, or do you really share the member for Scarborough Rouge River's opinion that the worst thing government can do is to give people hope. I know Jim Bradley. <laughs> well, Speaker, my understanding is in the committee that there has been only one deputation thus far, and that so-called expert is a staff person of the member opposite who's asking the question. I don't think that really qualifies him as an expert on e-petition. Uh, speaker, you, you know, we task members of the committee to do important work on behalf uh, of this legislature and of their constituents. This is an important issue. Uh, this government is uh, very much uh, open to ensuring the government is open, that there is more data that is available. And if the electronic petition is, is something that the committee wants to explore, we should let them do their work to hear from experts, to look at uh, other jurisdictions uh, as to uh, what the me mechanism would be. I think we should not be second uh, guessing or, or doubting uh, the members of the committee for the important uh, work they do in the committee. Speaker, and I thank them for the work yes, they have been doing on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, prior to the election, the Premier promised Ontarians that within 10 years, she would deliver train service every 15 minutes on all goal lines. She promised Kitchener, Guelph, and Brampton that they would see all day two-way service every 15 minutes within five years. But on Friday, the government drastically cut these transit plans. Instead of 15-minute service, people in Barrie and Newmarket will get 60-minute service. Instead of all day two-way service every 15 minutes, Kitchener, Guelph, and Brampton will get peak hour, peak direction service every 30 minutes. This government promised funding for rapid transit projects in Western. Hamilton, Brampton, and Durham, for Toronto Relief Line, for the Young Subway Extension, and on and on and on. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Premier. Minister of Transportation, sorry. Sir Transportation. Oh, thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, it's not often in this House that I have the opportunity to stand and speak so proudly with a setup like that from that particular member. Speaker, last Friday in Barrie, I was very proud to stand alongside the Premier as she announced that over the next decade, this government will invest $13.5 billion in transforming the GO Transit Network. Speaker, what we talked about that day means that there will be more than a doubling of peak service and quadrupling of off-peak service compared to where we stand today. Reduced journey times for some cross-region transit trips across this network and a much wider range of travel options right across the GTHA. And Speaker, just this morning, I stood alongside so many members and caucus colleagues from Peel Region to announce the province's commitment to build the $1.6 billion Pure Ontario Main LRT that will run from Mississauga to Brampton. That's the job that we're doing. We're going to keep building Ontario up. Get on board and join us. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? 
Order, please. Order, please. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 57, an act to create a framework for pooled registered pension plans and to make consequential amendments to other acts. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members please take their seats. Thank you. On March 25th, Mr. Souza moves second reading of Bill 57. All those in favor, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Nakfi. Mr. Nakfi. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Maurice. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dom. Mr. Dom. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Pe Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Renil. Mr. Renil. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Brown. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Harvath. Ms. Harvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelina. Madame Jelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. The ayes are 77, the nays are 17. The ayes being 77 and the nays being 17, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to the order of the House dated April 16th, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. Point of order for the member from Leeds Grenville. Speaker, point of order. Uh, in his response to uh, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, the government House Leader, I believe, impugned motive against an expert witness. It should be our three parties' choice who are expert witnesses. The government House Leader should not impugn anyone that we decide will come and appear before a committee. I, I appreciate, I appreciate uh, the member's uh, point of order, and it is only uh, a point of order when another member is impugned. Uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.